सो हेलो एवरी वन आवर नेक्स्ट चैप्टर इज अम्यूनोलॉजी सो फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल यू शुड नो वट इज वट डू यू मीन बाय पैथोजेनिसिटी पैथोजेनिसिटी मीन्स द अबिलिटी ऑफ द माइक्रो ऑर्गेनिजम्स टू कॉज डिजीज इन अ होस्ट सो इट्स द अबिलिटी ऑफ द स्पेसिफिक माइक्रोबियल स्पीशीज टू कॉज डिजीज इन अ होस्ट फॉर एग्जाम्पल uh the pathogenicity of species streptococcus pyogens it is the ability to cause throat and other infection right so other term is virulence so virulence on other hand it is measure of degree or intensity of the pathogenicity of particular strain so it relates to how severe the disease caused by a specific strain of a uh, microbe can be for example some strain of the influenza virus they cause mild illness while the other may lead to severe and even life threatening infection so this virulence of the strain it is influenced by genetic factors like presence of certain virulence genes the two terms that you should know what do you mean by exaltation and what do you mean by attenuation exaltation it is the enhancement of the virulence so it is a process by which the virulence of microbial strain it increases it often involves acquisition of new genetic elements or mutation that enhances the microbe organism ability to cause disease so viral exaltation it's the in, mayor of increase in the uh, virulence it is process by which the virulence of microbial strain it increases whereas attenuation is the decrease in the virulence so attenuation it is a process of reducing the virulence of the microbial strain the method includes passing the microbes through unfavorable host repeated culture in artificial media or subjecting to high temperature etc other terminology that you should know is what do you mean by toxigenicity so toxigenicity is the ability of the certain bacteria to produce toxins that can come that can cause harm to the host so bacterial toxin they are key factor in the pathogenesis of many infectious diseases now important is uh, what are exotoxin what are endotoxin and what is the difference between them exotoxin they are the protein they are the protein produced and secreted by a certain species of bacteria so exotoxins they are produced by both gram positive and gram negative bacteria whereas the endotoxin they are produced by the gram negative bacteria the exotoxin they are protein whereas the endotoxin they are the lipopolysaccharides that fragment off the example of the tox exotoxin include the tetanus toxin and botulism toxin so exotoxin they can be treated with formaldehyde to yield to yield toxoid which are non toxic exotoxin they are highly antigenic whereas the endotoxin they are poorly antigenic uh exotoxin they are heat labile whereas endotoxin they are heat stable
endotoxin they are heat stable lipopolysaccharides that are the part of gram negative bacteria so their toxicity they are their toxicity primarily depend upon the lipid component that is known as lipid a endotoxin they are not actively excreted by bacteria but are released when the bacterial cell it disintegrate unlike the exotoxin endotoxin cannot be converted into toxoid endotoxin they can cause various effects in hosts including fever leukopenia thrombocytopenia so iv administration of large dose of endotoxin can lead to endotoxin shock that is a potential life threatening condition other terminology that you should know is what is bacteremia bacteremia refers to the presence of bacteria that are circulating in the blood stream it means that bacteria from a local infection or another source have entered the blood stream but it does not necessarily imply a wide spread systemic infection what is septicemia septicemia it is more severe than bacteremia it refers to presence of bacteria in the blood like the bacteremia but it also involves the multiplication of these bacteria in the blood stream so in addition the septicemia can lead to production of toxic products by the bacteria and it is associated with high fever so septicemia can be life threatening as toxin and bacteria circulating in the blood stream can have a harmful effect on various organs and system in the body what is pyemia pyemia it is caused by the pyogenic bacteria pyogenic bacteria are organisms that are that are known to to form pus so these abscess they are localized collection of pus and hallmark of pyemia so these are the etiology that you should know now let us discuss about the immunity and the types of immunity the immunity can be innate immunity or adaptive immunity the adaptive immunity can be natural or artificial natural can be subdivided into artificial and passive whereas the artificial adaptive immunity it can be divided into again into active and passive immunity so the innate immunity remember it acts as it serve as body primary defense against the infection offering immediate first defense against the infection so innate immunity it is also known as natural or native immunity so this innate immunity can be considered at different levels including species races or individual so the innate immunity it's the natural or native immunity it consists of four type of defense barriers that are the anatomical barriers phagocytic barriers blood proteins or cytokines anatomical barriers included the includes the physical structures and characteristic of body that act as a first line of defense against the invading pathogens example are the skin mucous membrane and various structures uh, in the different part of the body 
like the respiratory, digestive and urinary tract. So these barriers would act as a physical blockage that prevents many, uh, many pathogens from entering the body and causing infection. For example, the intact skin, it acts as a barrier to prevent pathogen from entering through the outermost layer. Second is the phagocytic barrier. It involves the action of phagocytic cells like macrophages, neutrophils and dendritic cells. So these cells, they are specialized immune cells that are capable of phagocytosis. So that means they can engulf and digest the foreign invaders like bacteria and other microorganisms. The third are the blood protein in innate immunity that includes components like components like uh, uh, complement protein that are part of the complement system and various uh, acute phase proteins. Acute phase proteins, they are produced by liver in response to infection or inflammation. Whereas the complement proteins, they are a group of serum proteins that play a role in enhancing the immune response. The last are the cytokines. Cytokines, they are the signaling molecules that are produced by immune cells. They play a role in regulating the innate immunity. So they can, cytokines have various functions including activating the immune cells, promoting inflammation and coordinating the body response to infection. So innate immunity will rely on these four barriers. Defense barriers to provide immediate and non-specific protection against the, against the pathogen. Now what are the factors? that affect the innate immunity. Uh, the first is the age, the very young and elderly, they are generally more susceptible to infectious diseases. The fetus in utero, it is protected from the maternal infection by the placental barrier. But sometimes pathogen, they can cross the uh, barrier and lead to fetal infection. The second are the hormones. Hormones can, af uh, can affect the susceptibility example, the onset of puberty can lead to spontaneous uh, cure of the infection. Some infections like poliomyelitis, chickenpox, they can be severe in adults than in children due to the hypersensitivity reaction. Endocrine disorders like diabetes, hypothyroidism, adrenal dysfunction, they can enhance the susceptibility to infection. Corticosteroids, they can suppress the host immunity. Elevated steroid, steroid level during the pregnancy uh, may increase susceptibility to infections. Third is the nutrition. Malnutrition has complex relation with the immunity. So severe protein deficiency can lead to negative responses in the cell mediated immune test like the Mantox test, etc. Now, what is acquired immunity? Acquired immunity, it is the immunity that is developed by host after exposure to suitable antigen or after transfer of antibodies from immune donor. Adaptive or acquired immunity it is the resistance that an individual develops during the lifetime by recognizing and selectively, uh, selectively eliminating the specific foreign molecules or the antigens. The acquired immunity will depend upon the four factors. Uh, the first is the antigenic specificity. So, antigenic specificity refers to the ability of the immune system to distinguish and respond to specific foreign molecules known as antigens. Like in case of infection with the measles virus, the immune system recognizes and specifically targets the antigen on surface of virus. It 
does not respond in same way to unrelated pathogens like the flu virus. So it is like your immune system ability to recognize and react to specific enemies. It is as it, it knows who the bad guys are. Think of measles virus as one of these bad guys. So your immune system can spot the specific signals on the measles virus and fight it. But it won't react the same way to the other viruses like the flu. So that is antigenic specificity. The second is diversity. Uh, so imagine, uh, consider the influenza virus which can mutate over time. So imagine the flu virus that changes its appearance over time. So your diverse immune system can create, uh, so it can mutate over uh, time. That means it can change its appearance over time. So your diverse immune system, it can create new soldiers. That is the antibodies to deal with each look, each new look the virus takes on. So it's the immune system diversity that allows it to generate new antibodies. To recognize and compact different stains of the virus as they evolve. So that is the diversity. The third is the immunologic memory. So when an individual suppose is exposed to chickenpox virus for first time, their immune system generates a primary response to fight the infection. If they are now, if they are exposed to same virus again in future, the immune system memories allows it to produce a secondary response. which is more efficient at eliminating the virus. So that is the immunological memory. It is the capacity of the immune system to remember a stronger, more specific and faster response on encountering the same antigen for second time. The third is the self or non self recognition. So it's the unique feature of the immune system enabling it to distinguish between the body's own molecule and foreign antigens. Example, in the autoimmune uh, diseases like the rheumatoid arthritis, the immune system would fail to maintain self-tolerance and it mistakenly targets the body on joints, tissues as it weakens as if they were foreign invaders. So that results in inflammation and damage to the joint. So it's, this is a type of immunity that develops in response to exposure to specific antigens and is characterized by immune system ability to recognize and response to particular pathogens or the foreign substances. So it helps to distinguish between the body own molecules and the foreign antigen. So these are the four characteristics of the acquired immunity. Now acquired immunity can be of two types. One is active and other is passive. The active can be of two types, natural active or artificial active. So the active immunity, it is type of immunity that occurs when the individual immune system, it is exposed to pathogen or antigen that triggers the production of immune response. So it, these are of two types, natural active, uh, natural active immunity uh, occurs when the person it is exposed to live pathogen through natural infections or contact with the pathogen in the environment. So over the time, the immune system remembers how to fight that particular pathogen providing a long lasting protection. For example, if someone contracts, contacts and recover from chickenpox, the immune system develops natural active immunity 
making the making them immune to further chickenpox infection the second is the artificial active immunity the artificial active immunity occurs when the individual it is intentionally exposed to weakened or inactive form of pathogen usually through vaccination so artificial active immunity it is type of immunity that is induced by the vaccine vaccine they are prepared containing either live or killed microorganisms or their product that are that are used to stimulate the immune system so the live uh bacterial vaccine the example is bcg so it is used for tuberculosis the example of killed bacterial vaccine it's the cholera the example of bacterial product vaccine it's the tetanus toxoid vaccine that contains inactive bacterial toxins the example of a uh, live viral vaccine it's the oral polio virus that is the sabin vaccine so that contains live but weakened polio virus the example of killed viral uh, vaccine it's the sarc vaccine it's the injectable it's the injectable polio vaccine that contains inactive polio virus so the live vaccine typically provides long lasting immunity that can last for several years however booster dose they may be necessary to maintain protection killed vaccine on other hand they are generally less immunogenic means they produce a weaker immune response compared to the live vaccine protection for the Uh, from the killed vaccine usually lasts for a shorter period so booster dose they are often required the initial dose is the primary dose and subsequent doses they are the booster doses now the passive acquired immunity it is type of immunity that occurs when individual it receive preformed antibodies from an external source rather than producing these antibodies themselves through their own immune response it can be natural passive immunity or the artificial passive immunity so natural passive immunity or the artificial passive immunity so the natural passive immunity it occurs when a new born baby he acquires antibody antibodies from the mother so these antibodies these maternal antibodies they are transferred to baby during pregnancy through the placenta and through the breast milk during breast feeding so the transfer antibodies they provide temporary protection to the infant against specific infection until they are on until their own immune system matures so for example a mother who has immunity to particular disease like the measles can pass on the uh, can pass on the protective immunity to her baby so these maternal antibodies protect the baby from measles during the first month of the life other is the artificial passive immunity so that involves the administration of preformed 
एंटीबॉडीज और इम्यून कॉम्पोनेट दैट आर ड्राइव फ्रॉम द एक्सटर्नल सोर्स द एग्जाम्पल इज द यूज ऑफ द इम्यून ग्लोबिन so it is a preparation of antibodies to provide temporary protection against the diseases like like the hepatitis a rabies or the tetanus after the exposure to the pathogens so the source of the antibodies in the artificial passive immunity include the हाइपर इम्यून सीरा और कन्वलेसेंट सीरा सो हाइपर इम्यून सीरा दीज आर द सीरा दैट इज अपेड फ्रॉम द एनिमल्स और ह्यूमन्स हु हैव बीन एक्सपोज टू वैक्सीन अगेंस्ट स्पेसिफिक पैथोजन टू जनरेट अ हाई लेवल ऑफ एंटीबॉडीज लाइक द like the anti serum like the anti tetanus serum that is obtained from the hyper immune forces whereas the convalescent sera these are the sera that is collected from individual who have recently recovered from specific infectious disease so they contains a high level of antibodies against the pathogen that are responsible for disease like the pooled human gamma globin so it is a preparation of gamma globin uh, a component of blood plasma collected from pooled sera of the healthy adult donors now this is the difference between the active and the passive immunity the active immunity it is long lasting it has passive immunity it is short term uh so active immunity it is induced by infections or immunogens uh whereas passive immunity it is confirmed by administration of ready made antibodies active immunity has immunological memory present but in passive immunity no memory is there now other important term is a local immunity so this was it was performed by bufredka that is concept that is importance of the immune response at the site of the entry of pathogen in the body so local immunity it is site specific immune response like the gut mucosa and respiratory mucosa they are the common site of the pathogen entry example of the poliomyelitis in case of poliomyelitis the active immunization with the killed vaccine provides a systemic immunity so that means it can neutralize the virus once it enter the blood stream this type of immunity may not prevent the initial multiplication of virus at site of entry like the gut mucosa so the local intestinal immunity that can be acquired through the natural immunity with the live oral vaccine it is important for preventing the viral replication at point of entry other is the role of iga antibodies so local immunity often involves the production of specific class of immunoglobins that are iga secretory iga is one of the ig antibodies that is produced locally by the plasma cells It's present on the mucosal surface or in the secretory glands so the local immunity it is important in protecting against the pathogen that primarily enter the body through the mucosal route like the respiratory digestive tract whereas the herd immunity it is also known as community 
इम्यूनिटी और द पॉपुलेशन इम्यूनिटी रेफर्स टू द ओवरऑल लेवल ऑफ इम्यूनिटी विद इन कॉम्युनिटी और द पॉपुलेशन so it occurs when a large population of individuals in community become immune to particular pathogens like virus or bacteria next chapter we are going to discuss is antigen so what is an antigen so antigen it is a substance then uh, that when introduced in the body it triggers the production of specific antibodies so substance that are capable of inducing immune response so they can uh, recognized by surface uh, b cells or by the t cell so they can uh, either be recognized by the b cell receptors or the t cell receptors so they can bind with the antibodies or the t cell receptors now what do you mean by immunogenicity so the ability to induce a humoral or cell mediated immune response in summary antigens they are the substance that can trigger an immune response and can interact with the antibodies b cell receptors and the t cell receptors immunogens immunogens they are the subset of the antigens that can induce a detectable immune response antigenicity it refers to the ability to interact with the immune receptors whereas the immunogenicity it's the ability to provoke an immune response now how do we classify the antigen we can classify it into complete antigen or haptic so the complete antigen they are the substance that can induce antibody formation by themselves and can react specifically with these antibodies so the complete antigen they have two key attributes one is the immunogenicity and other is immunological reaction so they can induce the formation of antibodies by themselves when introduced into body they produce a specific and observable reaction with the antibodies generated what are haptans haptans are substance uh that they themselves are incapable of inducing antibody formation so that they lack immunogenicity haptans they become immunogenic that is capable of inducing antibody formation when they combine with the larger molecule with the large carrier molecule so with the large molecule they can bind so alone they cannot produce a immune response but on uh, but with the carrier molecule large carrier molecules uh, that results in production of the response so large carrier molecules particularly the proteins that is albumin and globin now what are the epitopes so epitope is known as antigenic determinant so antigen determinant it is the epitope so it is the smallest unit of antigenicity so the smallest unit of antigenicity is the epitope so it is a small area on Uh, the antigen that consists of four or five amino acid or monosaccharide residue 
so epitopes they present possess specific characteristic including a distinct chemical structure electrical charge and steric configuration so it is a part of macromolecule that is recognized by the immune cells so they have capacity to sensitize an immune cells and react with the complementary site on the specific antibody or t cell receptor now what are paratop paratop part of the antibody paratop is the part of antibody that recognize the epitope that recognize the epitope so combining area on the antibody molecule that corresponds to epitope it is known as paratop so the paratop on the antibody it will interact specifically with the epitope on the antigen contributing to specificity of the immunological reaction so many antigens such as bacteria or viruses they carry various type of epitopes so cross reactivity in the immunology can occur when different antigens share the same or similar epitope so that can lead to immune response against the antigen that are not the primary target now what are the factors uh, that influence whether a substance can function as an antigen in the immune system they are the number 1 is the size the antigenicity it is related to the molecular size so larger the molecular size they are highly antigenic so particle with the low molecular weight they are low they are non antigenic or have weak antigenicity second is the chemical nature natural occurring antigens they are often protein and polysaccharides which tends to be highly antigenic lipids and the nucleic acid they have lower antigenicity the protein that is composed of around 20 different amino acids it tends to be better antigens than the polysaccharides which have a fewer monosaccharides unit the third is the susceptibility to tissue enzymes only substances that are metabolized and susceptible to action of tissue enzymes behave as antigens so antigens introduced into body they are broken down the host into fragments with uh, the antigenic determinants so the phagocytes and the intracellular enzymes will play an important role in this breakdown so the synthetic polypeptide that are not metabolized in body are not antigenic while polypeptides they are antigenic so the immune response typically does not respond to an individual own normal constituent antigen so the ant antigenicity it is influenced by factor like size chemical nature susceptibility to tissue enzymes and for ignorance to the individual other are the auto antigens what are auto antigens at auto antigens they are they are the group of protein or molecules that are naturally present in patients own body so under normal circumstances these self antigens will not trigger an immune response because the immune system recognizes them as part of body in case of autoimmune disease the immune system loses its ability to tolerate the self antigens and mistakenly mount an immune response against them so this immune response results in body attacking its own tissues and organ 
that causes the characteristic symptoms and, and the damage that is seen in the autoimmune disease. What are, what are tumor antigens? They are also known as a new antigens. Tumor antigens are specific antigens presented by the cancer cells. And they are not uh, normally found on normal healthy uh, cells. So these antigens, they are referred as tumor specific antigens. The tumor antigens, they are typically displaced on the surface of tumor cells. Other are the heterophile antigens. So, that, uh, so these refer to the antigens that are same or closely related occurring in different biological species, class or kingdom. So the example of heterophile antigens, they are the Forceman antigen. So these heterophile uh, uh, antigens, they can be used in diagnostic serology. Uh, like in case with the wheel felix reaction that is used in diagnosis of typhus that involves the use of this heterophile antigen. So the antibodies that are produced during the course of typhus infection, they cross react with these antigen. Other is the pole bunnel test. So you should uh, know for entrance exam uh, that this test it is used in diagnostic of infectious mononucleosis. One question that you can get is Paul Bunnell test it is used for infectious mononucleosis. Other question you can get is it is it relies on the heterophile antigen to detect the presence of antibody specific to the Epstein-Barr virus. Other test is cold agglutinin test that is used in for the atypical pneumonia. So it uses the heterophile antigens to detect the cold agglutinins that are the antibodies that can agglutinate the red blood cells at lower temperature. Now what are the super antigens? Super antigens, they are the unique protein molecule like Staphylococcus enterotoxin. The example of super toxin is Staph enterotoxin. So that has ability to activate a large number of T cells. without considering their usual antigenic specificity. So the key points about the super antigens, they are, uh, there is broad activation of T cells. Unlike a typical antigen that activates specific T cells with the matching receptor. Super antigen would activate a vast number of T cells. Uh, super antigen interact differently with the T cell receptor compared to the conventional antigen. So uh, remember the super antigen it will it will attach to the lateral surface of T cell receptor rather than the antigen binding group. So it acts on the lateral surface. Super antigen produced by microbes, they are typically medium sized proteins with molecular weight uh, that range from 22 to 29 kilo Dalton. Super, uh, super antigen triggers the release of certain cytokines like the interleukin 2 
from the T cells. So the action of super antigen by causing the release of interleukin 2, it causes, it causes, it leads to extensive production proliferation of the T lymphocytes. So that means a large number of T cells, it uh, multiply rapidly. So as a consequence of massive T cell proliferation, a variety of cytokines, they are further relieved into the immune system. The next is innate immune system recognition. The innate immune system, it recognizes unique molecular protein that are common amongst various pathogens. Uh, the pathogen associated molecular protein that is PAMP, they are the broad molecules found on the surface of pathogen. They are recognized by the innate immune system as indicator of invading pathogen. Other are the pathogen re uh, re recognition receptors. So these are the receptors that binds to the uh, pathogen associated molecular patterns and play a role in recognizing a pathogen. So three class of pattern recognition receptors uh, they are present. The first is a toll-like receptors. So toll-like receptors, they are the transmembrane receptors that are found on the immune cells like macrophages and dendritic cells. Scavengers receptors. The example of scavenger receptors are CD36, CD68 and SRB1. So they can bind to the component of the bacterial cell wall like lipopolysaccharides and peptidoglycan. The third are the mannose receptors. So these receptors, they are, the, they are present on the surface of phagocytes. So the innate immune system, it recognizes the pathogen by identifying the specific molecular patterns that are known as PAMP. Scavenger receptors and mannose receptors that play a key role in this process. So this recognition allows the innate immune system to distinguish between the pathogen and host own cells and, and mount a defense against the invaders. Now we can classify the antigen based on their ability to induce the antibody formation into, uh, into T cell dependent and T cell independent. T cell antigen require the involvement, uh, the dependent antigens invo uh, require the involvement of the T cells specifically the helper T cells to stimulate the production of antibodies by B cells. So these are, these are typically more complex in structure such as erythrocytes, serum proteins. They trigger the production of various types of antibodies including IgM, IgG, IgA and IgE. Whereas the T cell independent antigens, they can stimulate the production of antibodies by B cells without the involvement of the T cells. They are typically simpler consisting of limited number of epitopes. Example are the lipopolysaccharides and flagellar protein that is flagellin. Next topic is antibodies. What are antibodies? Antibodies, they are protein that have, that have a extreme high specificity for recognizing and binding to particular antigens. 
so antibodies they are proteins that recognize and binds to the particular antigen so antibodies they are produced in by the immune response in a response to exposure to the specific antigen so when the immune system it encounters a new pathogen it generates it generates antibody antibodies so one virus or microbes can have several antigenic determinant sites that are known as epitopes to which the different antibodies may bind what are immunoglobulins immunoglobulins they are the glycoprotein they, uh, that are produced by the immune system in response to exposure to the specific antigen so they have ability to recognize and bind to antigen that triggered their production so immunoglobulins they are gamma globulins they are also known as gamma globulins plasma cells which are type of the white blood cells are responsible for synthesis and secretion of the immunoglobulins immunoglobulins make about 25 to 30% of the total serum protein so these can be found in various bodily proteins tissues including serum tissue fluids and the mucosal surfaces remember all antibodies are immunoglobulins but all immunoglobulins may not be antibodies now let us consider the structure of immunoglobulins immunoglobulins they are composed of four polypeptide chains uh two identical light chains so this one is the light chain and two identical heavy chains so they are linked by the they are linked by the disulfide bonds so that are the disulfide bonds they are the they are the covalent bonds between formed between sulfur in the cysteine residue the light chains these light chains uh they they have a molecular weight of around 25000 so they are attached to the heavy chains with the help of so these this is the light chain and this one is the heavy chain and they are attached with the help of disulfide bonds so they comes in two variety the light chains they come in two variety one is the uh, kappa form and other is the another is the lambda form the heavy chains they have a molecular weight of around 50000 so the two heavy chains they are together joined uh through dimer and this association it is mediated by 1 to 5 disulfide bond now each heavy chain the each heavy chain has variable domain that is vh and and three constant domains that is ch1 ch2 and ch3 so this is ch1 region ch2 and ch3 
द लाइट चेन इट कंजिस्ट ऑफ इट कंजिस्ट ऑफ सिंगल वेरिएबल डोमेन एंड सिंगल कॉन्स्टेंट डोमेन so this one we l stands for variable for light chain and c stands for constant light chain constant variable for the light chain so remember hing region so this one is the hing region that is situated between where ch1 and ch2 so it is situated between ch1 and ch2 region so the both the heavy and light chain they have a variable region and a constant region uh, the variable region it is responsible for the variable region it is responsible for binding to specific antigen whereas the constant it is stable in structure and it determines the class of immunoglobulin that could be igg igm or iga so the variable uh, region would determine the uh, would responsible for binding uh, variable region is responsible for binding to specific antigen and constant region it is it determines the class of immunoglobulin so within each immunoglobulin the peptide chain there are intra chain disulfide bonds so these uh, there are intra chain disulfide bonds that will form loops so these loops they are compactly folded to create globular structures that are known as domains so the hing region we discussed earlier that it is region between ch1 and ch2 constant domain so what is the function of hing region it will provide it will provide flexibility to the antibody structure allowing it to move and adjust its orientation when binding to the antigen so this is the light chain and uh this one is the variable region for light chain this is constant region constant region for the light chain and this one is the hing axis that is situated between ch1 and ch2 region now the amino acid sequence of variable region of both light and heavy chains in immunoglobulin they are not uniformly variable along the length they consist of invariable region of invariable region and highly variable zones so what are the hyper variable regions so within the variable regions there are there are highly variable zones that are known as hyper variable regions or the hot spots so these region will play a role in formation of antigen binding sites where antibodies with react with specific epitopes on the antigen remember the hyper variable region it contains complementary determining regions that are known as cdr so the hyper variable region it contains the complementary determining region they are the specific parts of the hyper variable region that directly makes contact with the epitopes on the antigen 
Each immunoglobin peptide chain it contains internal disulfide links that are covalent bonds between the sulfur atoms in the cysteine residue. So these are disulfide bonds contribute to overall structure and stability of antibody. Now papayan it is a proteolytic enzyme that is derived from papaya latex. So it is commonly used to cleave the antibodies into smaller fragments. So when papayan it is used on antibodies, it breaks the specific bonds in the hing region of the uh, of the antibody. So the hing region we know it's the flexible segment that connects the two arms of Y-shaped antibody molecules. So action of papayan it results in formation of three main fragments, two identical FAB fragments. FAB stands for fragment antigen binding. And FC stands for fragment crystallization. Crystallizable. The fragment antigen binding region it is part of antibody that contains the antigen binding sites. It, con uh, it consists of variable region of both the uh, variable region of the both the heavy and the light chain. So these variable regions they are responsible for recognizing and binding to the specific antigen. So FAB region it is crucial for specificity of immune response as it determines which antigen the antibody can bind to. The FC region it is it is the constant portion of the antibody molecule. So remember it is located in carboxy terminal of heavy chain. Unlike the FAB region the FC does not this region does not possess antigen binding activity. Instead it plays a role in biological function of antibodies. So this region it is involved in interaction with other immune components like immune cells and complementary proteins. Now the pepsin enzyme we know it's a digestive enzyme that is found in the stomach. So when antibody they are when antibodies they are exposed to pepsin enzyme it cleaves the antibody molecules in the hing region just like the papaya. However the pepsin digestion it results in production of single fragment composed of two FAB units. So this fragment retains the antigen binding activity and they can bind to the antigen. Unlike papayan digestion in pepsin digestion the FC fragment it is typically not recovered intact. It is digested into the small peptides. That means that the FC region of antibody it is broken down into the smaller pieces and it is no longer available as the distinct fragment. Now let us discuss the various immunoglobins. The immunoglobins can be IgG, IgM, IgA, IgD and IgE. So the first immunoglobin is IgG. So remember the most abundant class of immunoglobin the, uh, it's the IgG. It constitutes of 80% of total immunoglobins in the blood. So it is the most abundant class in the serum and it is the major serum immunoglobin. It is present in blood. It can be present in blood, plasma and tissue fluid. Remember the immunoglobin G it contains fewer carbohydrates than the other immunoglobins. The normal serum concentration is about 8 to 16 milligram per uh, milligram per milliliter. The half life it is 23 days. So it has the longest of all it is the longest of all the immunoglobins. It has the half life of around 23 days. 
IgG it is the only immunoglobin that can be transported through the placenta from the mother to the fetus. So that can that will provide the passive immunity to the newborn. So remember the only immunoglobin that is transported through placenta it's the it's the IgG. So it can activate the complement system through the classic pathway. So the IgG it can it can activate the complement system through the classic classical pathway. So when the IgG antibodies it binds to an antigen, they can trigger a cascade of complement proteins that leads to destruction of the pathogen. IgG it can binds to the FC receptors on the surface of phagocytic cells such as macrophages and neutrophils. So this process it is it is known as opsonization. So it enhances the phagocytic phagocytosis of the pathogen by these immune cells. So IgG it has four subclasses that is Ig1, Ig2, Ig3 and Ig4. So remember Ig1, Ig3 and Ig4 they crosses the placenta and protects the fetus whereas Ig3 it activates the complement. Remember IgG it is typically monomeric. Uh, that means it consists of single antibody unit but occasionally it can exist in a polymerized form. So IgG it is uh, distributed uh, between the intravascular component and the extravascular component. That means extravascular means inside the blood vessels and outside of the blood vessels of the body. So as the half life of uh, its 23 days, that means it can remain in the bloodstream for an extended period of time. The breakdown and removal of IgG it is unique that it varies with the serum concentration. So when the level of IgG it's elevated in cases with the chronic malaria, Kalazar, The IgG synthesis against a particular antigen can be catabolized rapidly. So that this rapid catabolism that results in deficiency of specific antibody. In case of in case of hypogamma globinemia, uh, a condition that is caused by a low level of immunoglobins. Uh, IgG provided for treatment will be catabolized more slowly. So that means it will remain in blood for extended period of time for a longer. So it remains in blood for the longer duration and hence it supports the immune system. The next immunoglobin it's the IgA. Remember IgA it's the it's the second most uh, serum immunoglobin that constitute around 10 to 15 percent of the immunoglobin. It has a short half life of around 6 to 8 days. So uh, IgA it's mainly distributed in the secretions including the colostrum. That is the first milk that is produced by the memory glands after the child bulk. It's seen in saliva, tears, sweat and the wall of the intestine. So IgA, it, it occurs in two forms. Uh, the serum IgA and other, other is the secretory IgA. So Ig it is found on the mucosal surface and in secretion it exists as dimer that is formed by monomer they are 
are joined together at their carboxy terminal by a glycopeptide that is known as this J chain. So this dimeric form it is known as the scree tree component. So the scree tree co a component it contains it contains a glycine rich polypeptide that is known as that is called scree tree component or the scree tree piece. So it is glycine rich polypeptide. So this component it is produced by the uh, by the mucosal or glandular epithelial cells that are involved in protecting IgA uh, from denaturation by the bacterial proteases such as the intestinal mucosa. So secretory IgA it is relative resistance to the digestive enzymes. Uh, and it is a reducing agent which make it effective in protecting the mucosal surface from the invading pathogens. The breast milk which is rich in IgA it will provide protection for the newborns during the first month of life. The transfer of maternal IgA antibodies through the breast milk helps to boost the infant's immunity. Uh, well, IgA it IgA it does not fix the complement, but it can activate the alternate complement pathway. So there are two subclasses of IgA that is IgA one and IgA two. Uh, IgA2 it lacks the interchain disulfide bonds between the heavy and the light chain. The next immunoglobin it's the IgM. IgM it is a pentameric uh, consisting of five immunoglobins. It consists of around five to eight percent of the total serum immunoglobins. So the molecular weight is around 9 lakh. So that is why it is known as millionary molecule. So which one is a millionary molecule? It's the IgM. So most of the IgM it is found within the intravascular uh, compartment. IgM remember it is Consider as the oldest immunoglobin class from the evolutionary perspective. It is the earliest uh, synthesized immunoglobin by the fetus in around 20 weeks of age. It cannot cross the placenta and its presence in the fetus or newborn it can integrate the intrauterine infections and making it a useful diagnostic in congenital infections like syphilis, rubella and the HIV infections. So presence of IgM antibodies in serum of newborn would indicate congenital infection. IgM they are relative short lived and disappear from the bloodstream earlier than the IgG. So presence of IgM in serum it is indication of the recent infection. So which immunoglobin that is produced in the primary response to antigen it's the it's the IgM. Which immunoglobin is to be synthesized earliest by fetus it's the it's the IgM. Which uh, immunoglobin it's known as millenary molecule it's the IgM. So IgM it is significantly more effective than the IgG in the bacterial action bacterial agglutination and protection against the blood invasion by the microorganisms. So there are two subclasses of IgM IgM1 and 2. The next is immunoglobin D. Immunoglobin D it's present in the bloodstream at concentration about 3 mg per 100 ml. 
so half life it is around 3 days and it is mainly mainly intravascular in distribution so it is present on the surface of unstimulated beta uh, b lymphocytes in the blood and it act as a recognition receptor for the antigen so the binding of antigen to the cell membrane bound igd it activates the b cells leading to its cloning and production of antibodies so its main action is in the secondary response so the main antibody in the secondary response is remember it's the igd it plays a role in opsonization of the bacteria and making them easier to phagocytize it crosses the placenta it's of two type igd1 and igd2 immunoglobin e its half life is 2 to 3 it is mainly produced in the lining of respiratory and intestinal tracts also known as reagent anti body it mediates the type 1 hypersensitivity reaction that is responsible for asthma hay fever etc so it cannot cross the placenta barrier it is responsible for anaphylactic type of reaction also play important role in helminth parasites parasites so the igg remember it protects the blood fluids iga protects the body surfaces igm protects the blood stream igd mediates the reagent hypersensitivity and ige it's its molecule on the surface of the b lymphocytes now what are the abnormal immunoglobins the ones are the benz jones proteins in the multiple myeloma that you should know benz jones protein are seen in case with the multiple myeloma another important mcq point of view so it is type it is typically found in the urine of patient with multiple myeloma a type of blood cancer that is characterized by uncontrolled pro proliferation of the plasma cells so the benz jones proteins they are uniform in nature meaning they are composed of either kappa or lambda like chains but not the both so multiple myeloma can affect the plasma cells producing various types of immunoglobins like igg iga igd or ige so this condition it is known as walden strom macroglobulinemia when it affects the igm producing cells so in wolf uh, wolfstrom macroglobulinemia excess pr production of myeloma proteins that is the m protein and they are associated with the light chains the heavy chain disease it is form of a para proteinemia that is associated with the lymphoid neoplasia that is characteristic by characterized by over production of fc that is the fragment crystallizable part of the immunoglobin other is the cryoglobinemia it is a condition in which the gel or precipitate forms in the blood serum when it is cooled but redissolves upon warming so this can a condition can be seen in various diseases like myeloma macroglobinemia and autoimmune conditions like sle etc now let us discuss the antigen antibody reaction so it occurs in three stages that is the primary stage secondary stage and the tertiary stage the first is the primary stage so primary stage it is the initial interaction between the antigen and the antibody so during this stage you will so you will see no visible effect or any macroscopic changes so no visible effects can be seen in the primary stage the reaction is rapid and it can occur at low temperature and it is generally 
reversible. So it follows the general laws of physical chemistry and thermodynamics. The primary reaction it is reversible, meaning the combination between the antigen and antibody molecule it can be broken. Now the interaction it is it is primarily influenced by the weaker intermolecular forces like like the there are the van der Waal forces, ionic forces, and hydrogen bonding forces, rather than the strong covalent bonding. The primary reaction can be detected by using various physical and chemical methods, technique like use of markers such as radioactive isotopes, clots and dyes can be used here. The second is the scandy stage. The primary stage it is followed by the it is followed by the scandy changes. So here here you will see the macroscopic changes. So uh, the first is that there will be formation of insoluble antigen antibody complex. So a glutination would occur. That means there will be clumping of particles such as bacteria or the RBC. Uh, there is destruction of the cells, killing of the live antigens. So destruction of living microorganism can occur. There can be neutralization of toxins that involves the involves the inactivation of the hormonal toxins, activation of the complement system that enhances the immune response, uh, and enhancement of phagocytosis that fa facilitating the engulfment of antigen by the phagocytic cells. So these all are covered in the secondary uh, stage. The third is the tertiary stage. The tertiary stage involves antigen antibody reaction that occurs in vivo. That means within the living organisms. So antigen antibody reaction initial initiate the chain reaction that could lead to that could lead to neutralization or destruction of injurious antigens so that is the important aspect of the immune response where the antibodies it works to neutralize or eliminate the harmful antigen such as pathogen or the toxin so in some case the immune response can lead to unintended tissue damage such as such as autoimmune diseases these are the diseases where the body immune response uh, mistakenly it targets in its own tissues so uh, the tertiary it includes the moral immunity against the infectious diseases as well as clinical energy allergies and other immunological diseases so these are the general features uh, these are the stages of of the these are the three stages of antigen antibody reaction. Now, what are the general features of antigen antibody reaction? The number uh, the general features the first uh, feature is antigen antibody specificity. So, antigen antibody reaction they are generally specific. So, antigen uh, antigen uh, will combine only with homologous antibody. The specificity it is the hallmark of this reaction. So cross reaction could be seen when the antigen they share a similar structure. They have a similar structure that leads to interaction with the known homologous antibody. The other feature is the entire molecule react. That means that means the whole antigen molecule it reacts with the antibody 
So when antigen determinant that is epitope on the large molecule or carrier particle it binds to specific antibody, the entire molecule or the particles they are agglutinated or precipitated. That that is the feature of antigen antibody reaction. The third is antigen antibody reaction do not involve denaturation. So that means that there would not be any change in the primary structure of these molecules. The combination between the antigen antibody reaction it takes place at the surface of the antigen. The combination it is firm but reversible. So remember the strength of this union it is influenced by both the affinity as well as ability. Affinity refers to the strength of the attraction between the antigen and antigen and the antibody molecule. Whereas the ability it refers to strength of bond after formation of antigen antibody complex. Now what are the serological reactions that would occur. The first is the precipitation reaction. So precipitation it is a serological reaction that occurs when a soluble antigen it combines with the specific antibody in the presence of in the presence of electrolyte at appropriate temperature and pH. So that forms a insoluble precipitate when the precipitate it remains suspended as flow. Uh, as the flocules, it, the reaction is called flocculation. So uh, there could be the phases of precipitation, uh, the amount of precipitate that would depend upon the, the amount of precipitate formed will depend upon the proportion of antigen and the antibody. So when increasing quantity of antigen, they are added to same amount of anti serum in different tubes precipitation it is more rapid and abundant so precipitation it is more rapid and abundant when the antigen antibody they are present in optimal or equivalent proportion so that zone is known as zone of equivalence now the phase of precipitation it can be characterized into three stages the one is the pro zone phenomenon that occurs when there is excess of when there is excess of antibody in the test system. So the reaction it is inhibited due to the uh, excess antibody. The zone of equivalence uh, is when the antigen antibody they are in optimal proportion. And post zone phenomenon it is when the when there is presence of excess antigen in the system leading to no or visible reaction. Now what is the mechanism of, so let us discuss the mechanism of precipitation. So the lattice hypothesis theory it was given by remember Marek. According to this hypothesis the multivalent antigen and bivalent antibodies they combine in varying proportion that lead uh, depending upon the antigen antibody ratio in the in the reaction mixture the, so the precipitation so precipitation it occurs when the large lattice structure it is formed consisting of alternate antigen and antibody molecules so that that lattice formation it is possible only in the zone of equivalence In the zone of antigen or antibody access, uh, the lattice does not enlarge because the valency of the antibody and antigen they are not fully satisfied. So this is the fundament of the lattice hypothesis theory. Now what are the application of this precipitation uh, reaction? So precipitation test they can be used in a forensic application. To identify the presence of specific substance in the stain such as such as blood and seminal stains. 
so that can these test helps in identifying bodily fluids at crime scenes or in other forensic investigation it can be used as testing for food or adulterations so they are used to identify the presence of unauthorized or potentially harmful substances in food products ensuring the food safety and quality uh, used in grouping of streptococci the lens field technology technique it is a serological method that utilizes the precipitation reaction to group different strains of streptococci based on their based on their antigenic property so this technique aid in classification and identification of streptococci species also used in a bdrr test for syphilis so that is based upon the principle of flocculation and test may at the presence of antibody in the patient serum that reacts with the antigen component of the syphilis other is the precipitation test they are used in standardization of toxins and toxoids used in uh, uh, to test the toxicity in the diphtheria bacilli now the precipitation and flocculation they are technique that are used to detect the presence of antigen and antibody so the common types of precipitation and flocculation test we use the first is the ring test so ring test it is the simplest form of the precipitation test uh, the antigen solution so this antigen solution it is layered over a column of anti serum so antibody in the anti serum that is layered over a column the antigen solution it is layered over the antibody in the anti serum in a narrow tube so at the junction you will see a precipitate that is formed at the junction of the two liquids so this this is known as the ring test so this one is the precipitate other is the slide it uh, other is the slide test in the slide test a drop each of antigen and the anti serum it is placed on a slide and mixed by shaking that results in formation of flocules that is the small suspended clumps the example of the slide uh, slide test it's the vdrl technique that is used for the syphilis the tube test it is another form of flocculation test so in this uh, a tube containing both the antigen and the anti serum uh that is that is used the example of the tube flocculation test is the kahan's test so which test it is uh, for the tube test it's the tube flocculation test is the kahan's test for the syphilis other is the immuno immunofluorescence so what are the types of various precipitation reaction uh, ring test flocculation test or the immuno diffusion test what is immuno diffusion test immuno diffusion it involves the diffusion of the antigen and antibody through a gel medium rather than a liquid medium so it allows formation of distinct bands of precipitate that are stable and can be stained for preservation so what are the advantages of immuno diffusion one of the major advantage of the immuno diffusion is that the resulting reaction is visible as distinct brand uh, distinct band of the precipitation the precipitate formed is stable and can be stained for further analysis in the immuno diffusion each specific antigen and antibody interaction result in formation of distinct line of precipitation now what is agglutination reaction agglutination reaction it is a serological reaction that occurs when the particular antigen such as rbc it is mixed with the specific antibody in the presence of electrolyte 
and suitable pH that leads in clumping of the particles. So remember, egg glutination it is more sensitive than the precipitation for the detection of the antibody. It is highly effective for detecting antibodies. So egg glutination it is governed by the same principle as the precipitation. It occurs optimally when the antigen antibody they react in the equivalent proportion. Similar to the precipitation, the John phenomenon may be seen in the agglutination reaction. Let us discuss the various types of agglutination. The first is the slide agglutination test. So in the slide agglutination test, a drop of antiserum that contains the antibody, it is mixed with the uniform suspension of the antigen So if the antigen it is present in sample and there are specific antibodies in the antiserum that can bind to antigen that will form visible clumps. So this reaction is the basis for the slide agglutination test and it is simple and effective way to uh, detect the presence of specific antigen or antibodies in the sample. The tube agglutination test, it is a laboratory test that is used to, uh, that is used to uh, detect and quantify the presence of antibodies in patient serum or plasma. So it is, it is a valuable diagnostic, uh, it is valuable in diagnosing the infectious diseases and determining the level of antibody that person can develop in response to specific pathogen. So the tube agglutination, it is based upon the agglutination reaction, which occurs when the antibodies in the serum interacts with the specific antigen. So in this test, the serum or plasma of the patient, it is serially diluted and each dilution, it is mixed with the known quantity of the particular antigen. So a series of test tube it is prepared and the patient serum it is diluted in a stepwise manner. So typically that involves the doubling the dilution meaning that each tube contains half the concentration of antibodies as the previous ones. So to each test tube a specific antigen is added. The antigen it is chosen it is chosen based upon the based on the suspected disease. So the content of each test tube they are mixed and incubated at appro appropriate temperature for specific time. So after incubation the tubes are observed for agglutination. If the agglutination occurs, that means that the antibodies in the patient serum they have reacted with the antigen. So positive test would indicate formation of clumps at the bottom of the test tube. So this method it is used to diagnose infectious diseases like Vidal test. In the blood typing in, hemo, in immunohematology tube agglutination it is used to determine individual blood type. So the tube uh, agglutination test, it is used for diagnosing the typhoid fever and it involves the two types of antigen that are the H or the O antigen. H is known as flagellar antigen uh, that forms large, loose, fluffy clumps resembling wisp of cotton wool when combined with its antibody whereas the O, o is known as a somatic antigen that forms a tight compact deposit resembling a chalk powder when, re when reacting with the antibody. Other is the antiglobin test. It is also known as the Coombs test. So the Coombs test, it is used for detection of the 
it is used for detection of incomplete anti-RH antibodies. So incomplete antibodies are the antibodies that are bound to the surface of red blood cells without causing visible agglutination or clumping. So these antibodies they are known as incomplete antibodies because they don't directly lead to agglutination when attached to RBC. So patient blood sample which contains RBC with attached antibodies it is collected if the present uh, the RBCs they are carefully washed to remove the unbound antibodies. So only those attached to RBC they remain. Now a Coombe reagent that is known as anti-globulin that is known as Coombe's reagent that consists of rabbit anti-serum against human gamma globulin. It is added to the washed RBCs and if there are antibody bound to RBC to addition of Coombe reagent uh, that would indicate a positive reaction. So the Coombe test it is vital in various clinical situations including the uh, blood compatibility. It is used to it is used to determine if a person blood is it is compatible with the donor's blood before transfusion. In case of hemolytic anemia diagnosis where the body's immune system mistakenly attack its own RBC, the Coom test it is used to detect the presence of antibodies on the patient RBC. The test can be also used to identify whether a newborn has RBC. Uh, antibodies transferred from the mother that can lead to the hemolytic anemia diagnosis. Now in the direct uh, Coombs test, the sensitization of erythrocytes with the incomplete antibodies it occurs in the vivo whereas in the indirect immunofluorescence that involves the vitro in vitro sensitization of red cells with the antibody globally. So the indirect Coombs test it is performed in vitro that is done outside the body. Other is the complementary complement fixation test. It is a sensitive laboratory test that is used to detect the presence of specific antibodies in the patient blood. So this test is based on fact when the antibodies they combine with the antigens they can also interact with the set of proteins that are known as complement. So the complement fixation test it, it needs five things the antigen, the substance you are testing for, the patient antibody containing serum, complement sheep red blood cells and embo septors that is a special antibody. So five things we need antigen, antibody containing serum, complement complement sheep RBCs and a emboceptor. Emboceptor it is a special antibody so the patient blood uh, the patient serum that is the blood without cells it is heated to destroy any complement activity. Other is the neutralization test the bacterial exotoxin they are capable of producing neutralization antibodies that play a role in protection against diseases like diphtheria and tetanus. So the toxin molecules that reacts with cell to form a, uh, the cell that is damaged by the toxins. 
So the toxin molecules, with the help of antitoxin, they will neutralize the toxin, and there will be undamaged cells. So neutralization reaction uh, can occur in vivo or vitro. Example is Schick test and Nagler reaction. That is in vitro and vivo. It's the Schick test. Now, what is opsonization? Opsonization. It was originally coined by term Sir Aldenroth Wright. He described a heat labile substance that is found in fresh normal sera that played a role in facilitating the phagocytosis. So this substance was later identified as the component of the complement system. So opsonization it is a process by which the particulate antigen becomes more susceptible to phagocytosis. What is opsonin index? It is defined as the ratio of phagocytic activity of the patient blood for a particular bacterium to the phagocytic activity of blood from a normal healthy individual. The phagocytic index, it is the average number of phagocytized bacteria per a polymorphonuclear leukocytes from the stained blood films. The other technique is the immunofluorescence. Let us discuss that. In the immunofluorescence, it is a property of fluorescence to visualize and ad identify the specific antigen or proteins within the biological sample. So here we use the fluorescent dyes. So most common dyes used are fluorescein isothionate and isamine rhodamine dyes. So fluorescent, it is ability of certain molecules uh, that are known as fluorescent dyes to absorb a light at one wavelength and emit light at a longer wavelength. So when exposed to UV lights or visible light, these dyes will become excited and emit light at different visible wavelength. So this property would make them useful for labeling and visualizing the specific molecules. So immunofluorescence, uh, it has several diagnostic and research application. It can be used in immunofluorescence microscopy. It can be used in immunohistochemistry, in flow cytometry, and it can be used for uh, disease diagnosis to identify the disease markers like viral antigens or autoimmune antibodies. Now, immunofluorescence it can be of two types. The direct immunofluorescence and the indirect immunofluorescence. So in the direct immunofluorescence, it is valuable diagnostic method for the identification of bacteria, viruses or other antigens in the samples. So it involves the use of specific, specific anti serum that is the serum containing antibodies specific to particular antigen that is labeled with fluorescent dye. So this dye would allow for the visualization and detection of the antigen in the sample. So the direct immunofluorescence it is used for diagnosis of infectious diseases like the rabies. So it is used to detect the rabies antigen in the brain smears. So in this test, a specific anti serum, it is conjugated chemically linked to a fluorescent dye that 
allows the labeled antibodies to bind to the target antigen and it emits fluorescent signals when exposed to appropriate wavelength of the light. So one of the main drawback of this direct immunofluorescent is that separate fluorescent conjugate need to be prepared for each specific antigen that is need to be tested. So this method is primarily used when you already know the specific antigen and you want to target it. So it may not be ideal for discovery of new or unknown antigen. The indirect immunofluorescence it is a variation of immunofluorescence technique so that overcomes some of the limitation of the direct approach. So in an indirect immunofluorescent test, an antiglobin fluorescent conjugation, antiglobin fluorescent conjugate is used. In the direct immunofluorescent test, a separate fluorescent conjugates need to be prepared for each specific antigen that is to be tested. So that can be time consuming but in case of the indirect method that simplifies the process by using fluorescent labeled antiserum to the human gamma globin. So this antiserum can be employed for detection for detecting the human antibodies to various antigen. An example is uh, fluorescent treponoma antibodies test that is used in case of syphilis. So in this test a smear of treponema palladium is placed on slide and a drop of test serum its patient serum containing antibody it is added. So after incubation the slide it is washed to remove the unbound serum. So if the serum it contains antibodies against the treponema palladium, so these antibodies would coat the surface of the treponema. So the next step is involves the smear with fluorescent labeled antiserum to human gamma globin. So this fluorescent conjugate reacts with the antiglobin, antibody globin that is bound to the treponema. So when the slide it is examined under UV light that if the test is positive there will be presence of anti treponema palladium anti treponema body antibodies in the patient serum. So the treponema will appear bright object against a dark background. So if serum does not contain anti treponema antibodies there will be no glob uh, there will be no globin coating on the treponema and they will not take fluorescent conjugate. Other is the radio amino assay. It is a laboratory test that is used to measure very tiny amount of substance in the body like the like the hormones, drugs, disease markers, hepatitis B surface antigen, IgE and viral antigens. So th this test can detect antigen up to picogram quantities. So in this test we mix a label substance with sample from the patient and let them compete. So after they compete we count how much of the label substance that is attached to the protein. And how much it is floating free. So it is used. So radio amino say it is used in many areas of medicine to measure things like hormones, drugs and disease related markers. Other test is ELISA. ELISA it is also known as it is used for detecting the presence of specific antigen like the viruses or proteins or the antibodies proteins that are produced by immune system. The ELISA term it comes from use of Immunosorbent. That that is a material that can absorb one part of reaction, either antigen or the antibody. 
So what are the immunosorbent material? In ELISA, an immunosorbent material, it is used as the base of the test. So this material, it is specific for one of the component of the reaction that can either be antigen or the antibody. So immunosorbent can be in various forms like solid plates, tubes or micro pipettes or the micro titer plates. So let us say you want to detect presence of rotavirus which causes gastrointestinal infection. So you start by using the micro titer plates that have been been specifically treated to capture the rotavirus antigen. So you then collect a sample in this case is a feces from the patient. So if the patient has a rotavirus infection then their feces may contain a rotavirus antigen. So you mix the patient fecal sample with the treated micro titer micro titer plates if they are uh, if there are rotavirus antigen in the feces they will stick to plate because of the specific treatment after certain time you wash the plates to remove any unattached material leaving behind only the captured rotavirus antigens now you introduced antibodies that are specific to the rotavirus so these antibodies will attach to the captured rotavirus antigen if they are present in the sample so to detect the presence of these attached antibodies you add an enzyme that reacts with the antibodies creating creating a color change that suggests the absence of rotavirus so use of elisa it is diagnosed it is used for HIV detection for infectious diseases like Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus. So let us discuss the types of ELISA. It can be either direct, indirect, sandwich or competitive. The direct ELISA, it involves immobilization of antigen directly on the surface of micro titer plate. So the enzyme conjugated primary antibodies, they are added to the plate. So after incubation, a suitable substrate it is added that leads to color change due to formation of enzyme substrate complex. So direct ELISA is a simple and faster uh, technique other is the indirect ELISA. In, uh, in the indirect ELISA, it uses it uses two uh, primary antibodies. The first one and this one is the second. The primary antibody and the secondary antibody. A capture antibody. So this one is the capture antibody and uh, this is the uh, detection antibody. So after immobilizing the antigen, the capture antibody binds to it. The detection antibody that is, uh, that is, uh, that is enzyme conjugated it binds to the capture antibody so this approach would increase the sensitivity because multiple antibodies can bind to the target antigen third is the sandwich ELISA so it involves two antibodies uh, capture antibody and a detection antibody which sandwich the target antigen so this target antigen instead of here it is in between so it involves two antibodies capture antibody and a detection antibody that sandwich the target antigen the last is the competitive ELISA 
it uses a competition between enzyme conjugated antibody and the antibodies that are present in sample for binding to single target antigen so these are the various technique in the sandwich the first step is the wells of micro titer plates they are coated with the coated with the uh, anti rotavirus antibody so the wells of micro pipette they are coated with a goat anti rota virus antibody that means the specific antibodies against the rota virus they are immobilized or coated on the surface of plates so these samples they are added and incubated for two hours so the antibodies in the sample it will bind to any rota virus present in the fecal uh, sample the step uh, the second step is the labeling and secondary antibody so after incubation the wells they are washed to remove any unbound substance or impurities the guinea pig anti rota virus anti serum the guinea pig anti rota virus anti serum that is labeled with alkaline phosphatase is added to the well so this antibody is specific to the rota virus and and can bind to any rota virus present in the well so the labeled antibody it serves as a detection antibody in the sandwich so after another washing step to remove the unbound labeled antibody is a suitable substrate uh, that is the substrate is para nitro phenyl phosphate it is added to well and the substrate undergo a chemical reaction with alkaline phosphatase enzyme that result in development of yellow color so this color it is indicative of enzyme activity so presence of yellow color denotes a positive test for the rota virus the other is chemoluminescence immunoassay it is a sensitive laboratory technique that is used for detection and quantification of specific analytes in the sample so its principle refer to production of the light as result of chemical reaction so in the chemi luminescence uh, compounds like luminol or esters they are used as labels when these compounds react with the specific enzyme or other substance in the presence of target analyte and antibodies they emit light other test are the immuno electron microscopy test that uh, that includes immunoferritin electro immuno electron microscope microscopy immuno enzyme test immuno blotting so immunoferritin test ferritin conjugated antibody it is used to react with the antigen uh, in immuno electron microscopy viral particles they are mixed with specific anti sera and they are observed under the electron microscope in the immuno enzyme as hey in the immuno enzyme test the tissue section are treated with peroxide labeled anti sera to detect the corresponding antigen in immuno blotting antibodies can detect protein in mixture so the mixture of protein it is electro uh, electrophorotically separated in a gel so the separated proteins they are transported uh, transferred from gel to the nitrocellulose paper so these nitrocellular paper strips they are acted with the test sera and subsequent with the enzyme conjugate enzyme conjugated anti human immunoglobulin so this test has been used to confirm the elisa positive hiv antibody cases so the above procedures may be used to apply analyze dna or rna uh, when dna is transferred on nitrocellular strips from gel it is known as southern blot test and if rna it is transferred it is known as northern blot test 
सो नॉर्दर्न ब्लड टेस्ट इट इज यूज टू डिटेक्ट आर एन एंड डी एन ए इट इज डिटेक्टेड बाय साउदर्न ब्लड टेस्ट 